I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanona Show, doing part two of cultural parasitism, Yaki, with Paul Fahrenheit. How you doing, Paul? I'm doing great, Mr. Pete. Thank you for having me on yet again. Let's finish this up. All right. Yeah, let's not waste any time. Let's share this and get it going. Uh, oh, Don. I am a professional. A professional what? I actually shut down. <laughs> I think I actually like turned off the uh, or exited out of the Yaki. Um, you know, PDF. only only the highest quality content creators, folks. Oh, we we are the best here, aren't we? Yeah, we're All just right, like so Gillette. Parasites. <laughs> All right, here we go. I found it. Not so difficult. I'm not going to edit this out. Normal, this happens a lot more often than people realize, but um, I usually edit it out. So, <laughs> well, this is this is the stuff that people that people tune in for. They love the little mess ups and authentic little moments. Yeah, let me see. Okay, what they don't know is that we plan this from the beginning to make the show seem more authentic. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. All right, so we finished up part three in the uh, cultural parasitism chapter and now we are on uh part four we're gonna do four five and six and that'll end it and then at a future date probably further down the road probably probably into the new year because you have stuff going on um we'll jump into the next chapter which is cultural distortion and i think that's when uh things really start to heat up in this book all right part four the materialistic 19th century saw this phenomenon of culture parasitism only as nation parasitism, and thus it was misunderstood in each nation as merely a local condition. For this reason, the phenomenon in each country called anti-Semitism was only a partial reaction to what was a cultural and not merely a national condition. Anti-Semitism is precisely analogous in culture pathology to the formation of antibodies in the bloodstream and human pathology. In both cases, the organism is resisting the alien life. Both are inevitable, organically necessary expressions of destiny. In fulfilling the proper, destiny combats the alien. It cannot be said too often that hatred and malice tolerance and goodwill have nothing whatever to do with this fundamental process. A culture is an organism, an organism of a different class from man, just as man is an organism of a different class from animals. But the fundamental regularities of organic life are present in all organisms of whatever class, plant, animal, man, culture. This hierarchy of organisms is obviously part of the divine plan, and it cannot be changed by a process of propaganda, no matter how continuous, tolerance, no matter how self-renouncing, or self-deception, no matter how complete. So let's let's restate what he's kind of talking about in these first two paragraphs here. So within the Yakian frame, it's I, I keep we keep calling it the Yakian framework. Really, it's the Spanglerian framework that Yaki is kind of adding to um just yaki is essentially updating the decline of the west after the second world war in the spenglerian framework there's a hierarchy was it there's a sort of um there's plant life animal life and then human life or man as animal above the above the animals themselves and then um and then Spengler differentiates the next highest form of life as a sort of a culture or a high culture. Um, and he treats this the same way that, you know, it's, it's a very, and it comes from, it comes from Goethe's kind of naturalistic way of looking at the world. Um, and so what Yaki's talking about here, the, the phenomenon of what has been labeled anti-Semitism was really just what your body does whenever a virus is in your bloodstream. You know, white blood cells, Mr. Pete, attack uh, any sort of foreign um, entity within your bloodstream in an attempt to eliminate it, to uh, prevent it from, you know, hijacking your body, hijacking, um, what is it, hijacking cells, red blood cells. And that's the same 
reaction because anti-Semitism, it, it's 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 it wasn't so much as Yaki is illustrating here a specific hatred or dislike. It's just the recognition of this is a foreign entity that is not only, you know, not only causing significant difficulty, but just disrupting the entire kind of equilibrium that existed prior to their introduction. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and really to un, reading these first two paragraphs out of, uh, out of the context of the first three sections of this chapter, um, can lead people to, um, make implications and they're, they're not there. You have to read the whole thing in order to understand exactly what he's saying here. But I think you, uh, you put it in a clinical way that it should be looked at because that's the way Yaki's writing it. So, well, all right, you know, and, and, and well, real quick, before you go on, let's, let's like review this real quick, just for the listeners who may not have immediately listened to the part one. Why are this group of people foreign? Why are they foreign? They are foreign because they are essentially residual holdovers from a previous high culture. That's pretty much it. They are a completely separate cultural entity from us. All right. That high culture, as all high cultures do, died and they got shotgunned across the world. In part one, Yaki talks about the various places that these people went and that they changed themselves, um, maintaining their inner cultural sort of being while adapting to the various external cultural places they went. All right. So this is why that they are a foreign antibody or they're not an antibody. They're a foreign entity rather to somewhere like the West, because the West is an entirely different cultural entity. If, you know, Mr. Pete, like 2000 years in the future and the West has died as a high culture, but you have like some holdover peoples, maybe they'll be looked at almost the exact same way um, by whatever later high culture comes as we look at this group of people today. Yes, especially if they are, especially if this cult, this leftover culture is, um, is taking control of certain means um, in which the culture that's existing at the time, that it's, it's not contributing to that culture, but it's basically disrupting it. Yeah, they're essentially living, you know, like, we, we've talked about in the last part, they're essentially living as a parasitic entity, siphoning off resources and um, positions that could be used for furthering that later high culture's cultural mission. Let's keep going. Onward. A treatment of anti-Semitism raises questions which belong with culture distortion rather than culture's parasitism, and it may suffice to say here that anti-Semitism, again, precisely like the human pathological phenomenon of formation of antibodies in the blood, is the other side of the existence of culture parasitism and is, is only to be understood as one of its effects. Anti-Semitism is completely organic and irrational. Just as a re, just as is reaction to human disease, cultural culture parasitism is the phenomenon of the total totally alien in coexistence with a host, and is also entirely irrational. There is no reason for cultural for culture parasitism. On the contrary, reason would seem to dictate that the alien group dissolve and flow into the surrounding life. This would end all the bitter persecution, the sterile hatred, the wasted fighting. But life is irrational, also during the age of rationalism. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great line. <laughs> life is irrational, also during the age of rationalism. In fact, the only way rationalism can come onto the stage is in the form of a religion, a faith, and irrationality. Yeah, and real quick on that point, you know, individual entities at the margins do oftentimes dissolve off this group and um, are taken up by the much larger high culture surrounding it. Uh, Erhard Milch is a good example of this. Uh, Alfred Rosenberg is another good example of this. All right. All right. The phenomenon of culture parasitism is not confined in a high culture to the mother soil of the culture. This is well shown by the history of America. America originated as a colony of the Western culture. This one sentence contains the whole fate of America. It sets in advance the limit to the potentialities of America. The idea of the colony must be examined. What is a colony? It is a creation of a culture. It is a work. By its mere successful plantation, it is something spiritually completed. 
This is another way of saying it has no inner necessity, no mission. It is thus dependent for its spiritual nourishment on the mother culture. This is as true of America in the Western culture as it was of Syracuse and Alexandria in the classical and, Gr and Granada and Seville in the Arabian. While fruitful impulses can, albeit rarely, come from the periphery of the cultural body, they find their significance in their development in the culture center. The spiritual dependence of colonies is weakness. This weakness is expressed by lack of resistance to the culturally alien, and one would expect to find less organic resistance to the culturally alien in a colony, for the sense of cultural mission is not generally present at all, but exists only in isolated individuals or tiny groups at best. Uh, you want to stop and comment on that right there? I mean, you know, what is it? Let's finish up the paragraph because okay. he kind of, he elaborates this more. Okay. The history of colonies shows us, Syracuse is one example, that culture crises, even auto autopathic ones like the appearance of rationalism, produce greater effects in them. A colony can be more easily de disintegrated because it lacks the articulation that the culture has. There is not, cannot be, a culture-bearing stratum in a colony. The stratum is an organ of the land-bound high culture. The culture cannot be transplanted, even though its populations migrate and remain in contact with the body of the culture. Colonies are products of a culture and represent life at a less complex and articulate, articulate level than the creating culture. So this is this paragraph right here is where I disagree with Yaki. Um Yaki asserts here that I, I, you know when the first time when I reread this for the for this um I I had an idea I had a feeling that you were going to disagree with this part yes and that's and that's and here's the thing once again the model Yaki is using I think is a very helpful and useful model um I what is it the thing is is that when he what is it? He he brings up the example of Syracuse as a colony of the Greco-Roman culture. Syracuse created some of the most, uh, was it Syracuse birthed some of the most important individuals within Greek culture. If I remember correctly, um, I think it was Archimedes who is who is from Syracuse. I'm going to fact check myself because I got a fact wrong last time and I want to make sure. Yes, Archimedes was one of the most important, what is it, was one of the most important Greek mathematicians of all time, and he came from Syracuse. All right. So I disagree with Yaki in this instance of how you cannot transplant the cultural mission of a culture-bearing stratum from one place to another. Um, now, I believe it does change given the different geography. All right. Um, Yaki believes... You know, Yaki believes, especially as he asserts in this paragraph, that a high culture is entirely limited to the geography from which it originates. Um, if that's the case, it cannot exist anywhere outside of its origin point. I believe that has been disproven by the, what is it, not by the example he uses, Syracuse, but also by the United States. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, you know, for example, Rome, Rome was begun its existence as a colony of Magna Gracchia. All right. That was the earliest recorded existence of Rome. Rome then proceeded to become the cultural center of the Greco-Roman high culture in its civilizational phase, in its imperial phase. I believe that the same thing is occurring in the United States. While he is correct that the cultural mission is not as highly concentrated, is not as present, is, is you know, what is it, is more easily overwhelmed. I do believe that is correct because, of course, if you take a tree and transplant it across the ocean, um, it, I don't want to say it loses an amount of vitality, but it changes. It changes, and its offspring change in reaction to the new geography, all right? While I believe... You know, I believe that that is the case. I do not believe that, what is it, that I'm out, that what is it, that it is limited to the geography of the origination of the high culture. All right. So 
you know, for those of you who say, you know, you can just read Yaki and get all of my opinions, you're wrong. You have to, I, I've read enough of Spengler and I've read enough of Yaki to know exactly where I disagree with them and where I think even within their own framework, they're incorrect. Well, the one thing that he said here about um, where, where does he imply the being more um, permissive when it comes to allowing other cultures, which would be allowing immigration in a colony as opposed to the uh, to the mother culture? I, I think there is something to that. There is, of course there is, um, you know, and the same was true in previous high cultures at the same time, those places which were, what is it, those places where colonies were set up are in many ways by their, you know, eventual minority status, they were able to much better define themselves, much better uh, create themselves than they otherwise, not, not than they otherwise would have, than they began as, as a colony. Onward. The comprehension of this elementary fact has always been unconsciously quite com complete in America and in the 20th century has been just as vehemently consciously denied. American men of letters in the 19th century assimilated Western culture inwardly and were assimilated by it. The phenomenon of Edgar Poe has always generated wonder by reason of his complete mastery of culture thinking and total independence of his colonial environment. In its higher branches, American Ballet has figured as a part of English literature and quite correctly as, regard most, as regards most of it. The poverty and meagerness of American letters is attributable to the colonial fate, while its few great names are expressions of Western culture. Americans of all high call of all callings through the past two centuries, insofar as they were or wish to be men of significance, have had their center of gravity in Europe. Irving, Hawthorne, Emerson, Whistler, Frank Harris, Henry James, the financial, the finance Plutar, uh, Plutar, plutocracy, plutocracy, Wilson, Ezra Pound. A tradition in America makes a European tour a part of education. Europe continued to possess spiritually those American elements with culture feelings or culture ambitions. In every generalization of organic subject matter, it is sought only to state the great regularity. The deviations always exist in living matter, but find their place only with respect to larger rhythms. Rationalist thought attempted to disintegrate organic thought uh, thinking by concentrating on the deviating incidents in an in the attempt to destroy the great sweeping organic rhythm. It had not even the depth sufficient to grasp the wisdom contained in the, in the saw, the exception proves the rule. Even though it became the fashion in America after its appearance as a world power following the Spanish War, 1898-1899, to deny its spiritual dependence upon Europe, the fact continued to exist. By this time, we are not surprised when a culture fact shows its disregard of human wishes, intentions, demands, statements. America is a subject that needs to be treated separately, as the culture disease of the West has given it a new significance in Western in world politics. In this place, the presence of culture parasitism in America is the only aspect under consideration. So, I've you know. I've already kind of stated my disagreements with uh, with Yaki here. Um, his, I you know honestly, Pete, what I think I need to do is you know how Yaki updated Decline of the West after World War II. I need to update um, Imperium after the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, in 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 short, was it? he's he. Everything he quotes here is factually correct, all right? Oftentimes, American letters are considered as a part of wider English literature. At the same time, I've, you know, I'm pretty well versed in both of them, and American literature is different. It is quite simply different. It is, it is, it is different enough from English culture that you could in many ways consider it its own separate nation. Um, and 
he also talks about its spiritual dependence on Europe. Um, and he uses the Spanish War as kind of the great moment. He kind of uh, he kind of utilizes this as the moment that culture parasitism kind of took hold in America after America denied its spiritual dependence upon Europe. Um, I believe if Yaki and I think you know if if Yaki were around today and he saw the kind of what is it the kind of thinkers that were starting to get on the American continent now, particularly within this political movement. Uh, and the wider associated scene, I believe his opinion may be tempered somewhat. He may still hold it, but once again, I've I've already kind of stated my disagreements here, and this is this is my most radical departure from Yaki, and it's always been since I first read him. Is that you know Yaki's opinion on America and my opinion on America are com are completely opposed. All right, part five. From the early 17th century onward, continuing to the early 19th century, slave trading brought millions of African Aborigines to America. These formed, during the 18th and first half of the 19th century, a large, prolific, and, tail and totally alien parasitic body. It is a good example of the cultural meaning of the term parasite that it has no reference to work in the economic sense. Thus, the Africans in America were economically important and, after an economy was built on them, necessary in a practical sense. Class war made it to the mode to made it the mode to refer to all persons other than the manual workers as parasites. This was a polemical term and has no community of any kind with the phenomenon of cultural parasitism. The Negro in America was the expression of cultural parasitism, despite economic utility. That's true. They've kind of been, what is it, you know, um, Nick Land calls it the most expensive commodity in history. Yeah, cotton was the most expensive commodity yeah, in history. Yeah. And this is this is something I will, you know, a lot of Virginia planters recognize this immediately after independence uh, was that you know, the, the, the institution gifted them by the British needed to go. Um, James Monroe and James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and uh, Charles Fenton Mercer, all being amongst the prime, the leading, the leading individuals on what was called the American Colonization Society. Mr. Pete, if you're not familiar, the American Colonization Society was a nonprofit organization in the early 19th century that played the most vital role in the purchasing the land and setting up the country that is now Liberia. Hmm. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Yep. I'll look that up. Cool. All right. Let's keep <clears throat> going. The first result of the presence of such a culture, culture parasitic body is known. He displaced unborn white men in America. By performing part of the life task, he made unborn millions unnecessary, and therefore this great mass of Africans has reduced the population of America by 10%, for at the present moment, 1948, the Africans make up 14 million out of a total of 140 million. You know what's funny? What? They haven't really grown more than that since. Yeah, about 3%. Yeah. The fashionable materialistic way of explaining this displacement in America is to say that white people will not bring children into the world to compete economically with the blacks and their lower living standard. Naturally, economic obsession explains everything economically, but the facts of population trends show that the population of an organic unity follows a life path that may even be described mathematically. It is entirely independent of immigration, of the wishes of individuals, and of non-organic explanations given for it. The displacement of culture, i.e. total, and is not to be fully explained by economics. The colonial mentality, more thoroughly disintegrated by the rationalist crisis, has been able to oppose no effective defense to the increasing displacement of the white population the vehicle of America's attachment to the West by the African with equal inability either to comprehend or to oppose America has not resisted while the rear guard of the Arabian culture, which was strewn throughout the West, even at its cultural origins has assumed larger numerical pro proportions and a vastly larger role than it ever had in Europe. Beginning around 1880, the Jews embarked upon what Hilaire, Hilaire Belloc 
aptly termed an invasion of the United States. The numbers alone would justify the figure. While they cannot be exactly given because of the fact that American immigration statistics reflect only legal origins, i.e. nation of legal allegiance, nevertheless, they can be approximated from a study of current American population figures and study of Jewish birth, of the Jewish birth rate. How typical this is of the total incongruence between two different cultures that a mass movement of members of one can occur within the other culture and leave no statistical trace. The immigrant was asked where he was born. That was determining of everything for 19th century materialism. It was supposed to fix his language, which then was supposed to govern his nationality. And nationality was supposed to preordain everything else. Such things as petrifacts of dead cultures, India, China, Islam, Jewry, were regarded as nations in the Western sense of the word. In form, rationalism was definitely a religion, but a bloodless materialistic caricature of true religion. Religion is properly directed towards the great higher things of man's spirituality, but rationalism tried to turn things like economics, state, society, nation into the object of its own religious concern. America began its independent political existence as a creature of rationalism. Its politicians agreed to the proposition externally that all men were created equal and even said that this was self-evident. To call it self-evident and thus dispense with proof was easier and perhaps wiser than to prove it. Proof would have spoiled what is actually a tenet of faith of a faith and thus above reason. The religion of rationalism dominated America in a way that it was never able to dominate Europe. Europe always had resistance against rationalism, based on tradition until the middle of the 19th century, and after that, based on anticipation of the coming anti-rationalist spirit of the 20th century, as exemplified in Carlyle and Nietzsche. But America did not possess the first because it had no tradition and had not the second because cultural impulses and the culture forwarding phenomena come from the mother soil and are thence radiated outward as the rationalistic religion of America came from England through France. America acquired even its section of Jewry from Europe, whence it had acquired its materialistic philosophy to both of which it succumbed. This was no coincidence. The word spread rapidly through the Jewish population of Europe that anti-Semitism was less of a threat in America and that other opportunities, such as the economic, were equal to those Europe offered, the, offered to the Jew. This was perfectly sound and was a tribute to the collectivist Jewish instinct. America did undoubtedly represent in the late 19th century a country with the greatest possibilities for the Jew. From 1880 to 1950, approximately, remember, no exact figures exist, five to seven million Jews arrived in America. They came mostly from the Eastern or Ashkenazic section of Jewry. At the present time, the Jews in America number approximately eight to 12 millions. An exact figure cannot be given because the number is not reflected in any statistics, but most but must be approximated from religious statistics and study of the birth rate. At any rate, it is a considerable number, and it displaces its own numbers of Americans from existence. The American writer Madison Grant in 1916 described how the Americans of the old stock was being the American of the old stock was being driven off the streets of New York City by the swarms of the Jews. He called them Polish Jews, as the older custom was to give the Jews a Western nationality. Westerners thus used to, defer, used to differentiate between English Jews, German Jews, and so forth. It was a compulsion of the Western civiliza civilization at that stage to see all other people outside the civilization in its own image. America, as the country most completely disintegrated by rationalism, exhibited the least understanding of the nature of the Jew. While there were always some people, while there were always some people in Europe, for instance, Carlyle, even during the 19th century, who realized the total and not merely political alienness of the Jew. But in America, with its complete lack of tradition, there were no Carlyles, no, no de la Gardes. 
Thus, America decided, America decided in the middle of the 19th century that a Chinaman born in the United States thereby acquired exactly the same American citizenship as the white native population of European de derivation. Characteristically, the decision was not made in a responsible fashion, but as the result of a lawsuit. This was in pursuance of an American custom of deciding political questions in a pseudo-legal form. Obviously, a regime which did not differentiate between Chinese and Native American would oppose no political barrier to the Jew. And so, by 1928, the French writer on historical and world political topics, André Siegfried, could say that New York City had a Semitic countenance. By the middle of the 20th century, this development had gone further, and New York City, the largest city in America, perhaps in the world, was almost half Jewish in population. Everything he's describing here did happen. Yeah. All right, part six, the final part of this chapter. America, with its total lack of spiritual resistance, springing from the inherent soul weakness of a colony, became the host to other large culturally parasitic groups. The period of dense immigration, which had begun before the turn of the 20th century and in which G the Jews came, brought in also many millions of Balkan Slavs. Between 1900 and 1915 alone, 15 million immigrants came to America from Asia, Africa, and Europe. They came mostly from Russia, the Levant, and the Balkan countries. From the Western civilization came a fair number of Italians, but the rest of the human material was from outside the West. These millions, by their very numbers, created phenomena of created phenomena of cultural of culture parasitism. On the edge of each group, individuals passed into the American feeling, but the groups continued to exist as such. This was shown by the existence of newspaper press for each group in its own language, unity of the groups for political purposes, geographical centralization of the various groups, and social exclusiveness of the groups. In examining the nature of race, we saw that Slavs could be, and have been, assimilated by European culture populations. Two features distinguish the American relationship to the Slav and explain why Slavs have retained their group existence even though surrounded by an American population under the influence of Western civilization. First, the fact of its colonial style of existence meant that America could not transmit to could not transmit to entering populations the, for, the forceful impress of the cultural idea that the Western nations on the mother on the mother soil could. Secondly, the enormous masses, numbering many millions, created by their mere bulk of pathological condition in the American organism. Even if these millions had been an, even if these mil, millions had been of Western antecedents, such as French or Spanish, they would have created a politically parasitic group. Naturally, such a group would have dissolved eventually, but in the process it would have had a distorting effect on policy in America. Slavic groups, on the other hand, in masses of millions, whose leaders are allowed facilities of welding the group into a firm unity, will only slowly, if ever, dissolve into the American host population under such conditions. America has other smaller parasitic groups, each of which displaces unborn Americans and calls forth the unfortunate displays of hatred and bitterness, which waste and twist a superpersonal life. There is a Japanese group, various Levantine groups, and the Russian group. Superficially, it might seem that the case of American of America militates against the 20th century view of race set forth above, but actually it does not. The American example is no criterion for Europe for being a colony. It is an area of low culture, cultural sensitivity with correspondingly less cultural force and assimilative power. In other words, the power of adaptation is slight, is slighter than of the mother soil. Hmm. The case of you, you good. Yeah, I just the thing is, is that is that once again, if Yaki's assertion that America is a colony and his characterization of a colony are correct, then all of this is correct. But I simply disagree that America is a colony. The case of America is not a case of assimilating too much. It is a case of not assimilating enough. Alien groups, whether merely potentially alien, such as a Western group in another Western nation, 
or totally alien, like the Jew and a Western host, are parasitic only so long as they are groups. When they dissolve, the totality of the assimilating population has increased. The fact that this has come from immigration rather than from increase by birth surpluses of the native population is not important. The mere fact that they could assimilate shows that they were not alien in a parasitic sense. Nor must this be ignored in examining cultural culture parasitism in America. This American population during the 19th century assimilated, assimilated many millions of Germans, Irish, English, and Scandinavians into its own bloodstream. The 20th century immigration did not come mainly from these European countries, but to the extent that it did, complete assimilation occurred. In the case of the immigrant Germans and Irish, the Yankee armies in the War of Secession employed them in great number and with great success, what never could have been done with culturally alien groups, example, Jews or Slavs. America has been called a melting pot. This it is not, for the massive groups of culturally alien provenance have not melted, but have remained distinct. I, the first time I ever heard it referred to as a salad, that made the most sense to me. Yeah. Groups not culturally alien have assimilated at once, which means in one generation, and thus the 20th century view of race applies also to the facts of the American scene. These unassimilated groups in America comprise between one-third and one-half of the population of America. The Slavic groups are apparently slowly being assimilated, but even if they disappeared entirely, the remaining culturally parasitic groups would comprise a pathological condition of the utmost seriousness for America. The old-fashioned view of vertical racism can de derive no instruction from the case of America, for what we see there is not the mixture of races, but their non-mixture. All of the parasitic groups have been torn loose from old landscapes, but have no new spiritual connections. Only the landless Jew, who carries nation, church, state, people, race, and culture within him, has preserved his ancient roots. The phenomenon of, cultural, of culture parasitism, even though divorced from ethics, is not outside the realm of policy. It does no good whatever to talk about culturally alien groups in terms of praise and blame, hatred, or tolerance. Wars, riots, massacres, destruction, the entire waste of senseless domestic conflict, all the phenomenon which inevitably rise when a host entertains a culture parasite remain as long as the pathological condition lasts. Culture parasitism, by calling forth resistant phenomena, has a doubly injurious effect on the body of the culture and its nations. A fever is a sign of resistance to a disease in a human, but this does not confer a positive health value on the fever. Its sole value is negative, and the fever itself is a part of the disease, even though the saving part. Resistant phenomena like the anti-Japaneseism and the and anti-Semitism and anti-Negroism of America are as undesirable as the conditions they are combating. Similarly, European anti-Semitism has no positive value, and moreover, it can, if exaggerated, easily develop into another type of cultural of culture pathology that aggra that aggravated condition which may proceed also from culture parasitism under certain circumstances namely culture distortion so he gets into a large part of that in the next chapter which we're probably going to go over in the future um i don't want you know mr pete we still got some time left and you know i i don't want this to just be you know what is it to just be the Paul disagrees with Yaki show. All right. Um, a lot of what he has stated here is correct. All right. America has taken in an unbelievable amount of foreign cultural forms. A lot of them, all, most all of them being dead cultural forms. Uh, the Slavs, he did suggest have more or less totally assimilated. Um, there's, you know, I mean, the thing is, I would suggest to, to, to Mr. Yaki is that um, despite itself, all right, the cultural impact of these people has remained largely limited to um, up until was it to up until recently coastal metropolitan areas. 
And um, also, what is it? Also, um, it's starting to become some interior metropolitan areas. Um, and he is correct in that so long as these entities remain within the United States, it will retain a sort of feverish influence upon the United States. Um, that being said, you are beginning to see a rising cultural consciousness within the old, the founding stock of the United States. Yaki says elsewhere in Imperium that the cultural mission cannot be repressed for longer than a generation or two. Um, even if you, what is it? Even if you try to genetically replace the individuals that carry it, right? It never, it's never 100% successful. And even the people who you've tried to kind of throw into a place will start joining the ranks of the previous cultural mission. The West has a cultural mission. It has yet to complete. And it has gone for a very long time because the disease of rationalism has essentially broke down one by one, every single cultural resistance that the West had in the pre-rationalist era of, you know, resisting foreign influences, resisting foreign entities. All right. This was the case in Europe. However, unlike Europe, which went through its entire phase of modernism and all that, America is a sort of, you know, at least a great part of it is a sort of preservation of many of the tendencies and abilities and attitudes of the Western high culture in a much earlier form, in a much earlier form. Um, and this is this is to its detriment when, you know, it just hit rationalism. Rationalism hit America much later than it hit most of Europe. Um, America had no real counter-revolution. Um, the closest thing it got was the Civil War. And because of this breakdown in cultural barriers, it has gotten itself into the situation it currently finds itself today. What has been very interesting and what has been always hiding under the surface is that there always has been a sort of looming backlash that, you know, you first saw exemplified, you know, it dominated for a time. He mentioned Madison Grant, Madison Grant and Lothrop Stoddard and um, trying to think there was a third one, um, Brooks Adams uh, and also to a certain extent, Henry Adams, the, the, the Adams brothers. They were all exemplifiers of the sort of wasp ruling elite, which was the closest thing to a reaction America had, you know, and so long as they were in charge, certain policies, you know, what was it when after the, this first battle in the early 20th century, you had some of the most restrictive immigration acts passed ever in the United States. Um, that was only undone with Hart Seller in 1965, um, which really kicked into overdrive this problem. So now, Mr. Pete, in the United States, uh, white Europeans remain, you know, discounting certain, remain the majority. This, uh, what is it? This minority by 2050 status is a prediction, but it is not real yet. All right. And America, specifically the founding stock of America, is starting to recognize what it is as a cultural entity more and more. First unconsciously, but more and more, more consciously. You know, we were talking about, we were talking before the show, it's almost mainstream now in the United States to name them. If in the United States, you can name them, all right, you can say who is causing this sort of culture, this culture parasitism, and even this culture distortion, that is the beginnings of this disease being gotten the better of, all right? Anti-Semitism in the United States has always been bubbling beneath the surface, has always been in unspoken attitudes, has always remained within the body of the Western high culture that is found within the United States. It has, it has required a significant exertion of material means 
to retard that cultural mission with things like dispensationalism, with things like, you know, Holocaust studies and all of that. And as always, it can only retard the mission. It can only slow it down. It cannot stop it. And we are finding that this backlash is starting to bubble up, is starting to express itself more than has ever been allowed in American history since probably the 1920s and 30s. Um, and like you saw with the skinhead movement and the militia movement in the 90s, it's always just waiting underneath the surface to come out. So... Compare this to the mother soil of the culture of Europe, which Yaki describes the origin of the Western high culture, um, at least according to Spengler's framework. I believe they have been completely and totally dispossessed of any cultural status they once had. Um, I've said, I've said as much on different streams before, uh, but in the United States, it is not illegal to question certain things and you are, you will not be arrested for mentioning certain things. It's starting to shift the other way in some places there as well. All right. This is a culture wide phenomenon. I believe that should success be found in the United States should the cultural mission gain enough steam where it cannot be slowed anymore in the United States. I believe that the West will finally shake off this cultural disease and will be able to fulfill its cultural mission. And if not, then we'll have found a different way for a high culture to die. The first time a high culture has died in the history of high cultures you know, high cultures usually die through petrification or through um, basically fiery destruction. This one will be a high culture that died from disease of essentially, you know, of, of, of pathologies basically bringing it under. If we were to use Yaki's framework. Anyway, that's kind of the extent of my thoughts on the, um, on the chapter, if you have any comments on those. Well... <laughs> I think what from the readings that we've done and especially the readings on race, when you, when you take into consideration that people who have been exposed to European culture, who are Europeans by blood, who are Europeans by, by race, that they can come here and they can assimilate properly Yet people who have been in Europe and resided in Europe for 17, 1800 years before even many of those cultures were created, before they saw their genesis, that they can't. It's just a without dealing with that in a way of just basically you know what what like aa would say just clear them out or jonathan bowden would say clear them out they gotta go um i don't see how we get past it unless they assimilate all all of a sudden you know it's like tim kelly always says he goes they're gonna have to accept christ or something because it's gonna lead to destruction you know and like we've talked about and I don't think you mind me bringing this up on the air. What we talked about off the air is, you know, having Israel in a place for them to go is a good thing. Yeah. But the fact is, is that they've set themselves up in a way that because of their centuries of being the victim and playing off of that victimhood, they... You know, I've said it, and I, I know this. This is you know this seems cruel, but in 1948 and especially in 1967, they should have just gotten those people out of there. They should have just cleared them out. You know what we're talking about? Clear them out. You got to get the, these people just do not mesh with your culture. Get them the hell out of there. 
do what you have to do to clear it out. And then you establish your own culture. But I think that the, these are these are people who have become so they rely so much upon their victimhood status that they need to keep these people around, abuse them every once in a while. And then when they fight back by owning the means of mass communication, they can go, look, we're trying to be nice to these people. We want to, somebody shared an article with me from like 2016, where they were talking about building a man-made island off of Gaza and, um, transferring them to this island, giving them their own economy, their own airport, all of this and everything. And I'm like, they never meant to do that. That is just another way of saying, look, we want to do this, but these people can't handle it. We're trying everything we can. We're the victims here. Cry for us. I mean, I don't know where to, I don't know where this goes. I don't know how, how this ends other than, you know, our friend Charles Haywood says that this is, you know, and not specifically towards, you know, violence towards Jewish populations, but in violence in general. Yeah. I just, how does it, how does this play out? Uh, I mean, in terms of the broader cultural mission, uh, either the Western high culture manages to, manages to fight its way through this disease by the grace of God, um, or it just simply succumbs to it. And we have in the books of history, a new high culture, a new way a high culture can die. Um, which, you know, the pessimist in me would say uh, the latter, it, 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 some might say it's too late and the latter is already going to happen. Um, I have to, you know, as long as I exist, I have to, I have to carry out the cultural mission. Um, but you're right, Mr. Pete, in that, you know, this does not have a peaceful ending, you know, assuming there, there, there is no, there is no ending of this in any way, shape or form where some sort of action is not taken. All right. Um, you know, recently, uh, you know, I, I, I I'll, I'll mention this before, but the political possibility of ending this is possible. It only lacks political will. Um, but it, it, it can be done. It can be done. There are outlets. It is simply a lack of creativity and a lack of will and a lack of ability to confront. All right. Um, and that's just the holdovers of a world that was obsessed with economics and lower things. And that's just what happens in high cultures. If a, you know, I, everyone, everyone, it's so trite, you know, you know, every time you say Caesar on a DR podcast, put a nickel in the, in the Caesar jar, take a drink, um, and, take a drink and get alcohol poisoning. Yeah. But like, that's, that's, it, it just seems to be, it's the only macro political way out. It's the only macro political way out. Um, and, um, and, and I think it can be done. You know, we've talked about there's various control valves, Israel being one, Liberia being another, you know, um, it's not like these people are, you know, it's not like all of these people are not from countries. It's not like they don't have places to go back to, you know, my initial policy was, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's this this has kind of been what America has tried to do um, is try to develop other places, um, maybe with the implicit assumption that if they make other places rich, they'll leave and go back. But it appears that that's just impossible. And so perhaps more drastic things. Well, need I mean, to be it's, done. it's impossible because what we're talking about, we're talking about culture. Yeah. They don't have a high culture that those places don't have a high culture that can, and we can't transfer, transfer one there that causes them to be prosperous. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, and perhaps it took, you know, people have to understand these things is that, you know, this is a long-term game, a cultural mission, like the, the West's cultural mission. If you take Spengler slash Yaki's framework, properly the west cultural mission began 1300 years ago if not a little bit longer um if a high culture lasts about 2000 years we've still got a long way to go um 
you know, we, we, we still have a, what is it? We still have, um, we still have, we, we're still in the fetters of the sort of rationalist era. You know, you saw a glimpse at what the future will be in the previous century. Um, so long as the cultural mission isn't brought down before it reaches its own fulfillment. In this coming century, you're already seeing trends extremely similar, just changed to this to these different circumstances of the last century at a much larger scale. So, you know, I don't know. I'm an American who doesn't think America is an evil concept and thinks America is a cultural entity and thinks America has a right to perpetuate its own existence culturally. I believe that culture is, stems from English culture, but from um, a couple of others as well. I believe that, uh, and, and I believe that um, because of the cultural similarity between all of those various uh, mother cultures that were on the original coat of arms of the United States, America, given its unique geography, then developed a wholly new expression of Western culture, you know? And because of that, I, I don't believe that's gone. I don't believe that can die until the cultural mission is fulfilled. And Pete, you and I both know what the cultural mission is. The cultural mission is colonization of space, you know? Believe it or not, Elon Musk is about as close as you can as you can get to someone who can fulfill the cultural mission. And it's no wonder he's starting to understand these things. But he came from another colony too. He came from South Africa, which is a sort of, if you want to see what the future of America looks like, assuming nothing different happens, you know, you look at South Africa. But I don't know, Mr. Pete, I have to be an optimist. I have to believe that my country has strength left in it has culture left in it you know that given our little attempt to kind of shift discourse our little attempt on this scene to kind of bring these ideas back into the fore i have to believe that these results which we are already seeing old stock heritage american are starting to be used everywhere and that denotes a waking cultural consciousness you know, and with the invention of the internet and with the disruption of the materialistic sort of means of mass media, as you see the generations get cycled out and the younger generation start learning more about the world, start placing them in a more and more economically, politically, governmentally important positions, culturally important positions, I think that at the very least, you will see a good shot at overcoming this you know we, we know that it is possible for governments people within governments to ch make change um, i have a subset coming out tomorrow where i talk about a few subjects but i also i talk about uh, bukele in el salvador this is a guy who arrested six thousand people in 10 days and like almost immediately the murder rate in this country dropped by half. He didn't even have, I mean, th and this is just his, what is his um, native population. This is people in his native population. It's just will. But what I see with politicians today, especially politicians in the United States is they are either, either or, and, but either, and, and it could be both, engineering the destruction, or they are anticipating the destruction, so they're just looting the treasury and getting as much as they can. So how do we fix it? And at this point, I mean, really, the only way that I can see that it can even be fixed a little bit is locally, is people stepping up and fixing their their local areas, you know, stepping up and doing that. Um, you know, El Salvador is a, a much smaller country than the United States. And I think the smaller, the better, but I think that's the only way that that's the way it starts. I, I don't know that waiting for Washington DC or waiting for Caesar is the way, I mean, I think we can have, you know, I think, 
you know, we can ride the tiger while this is going on. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree with you. I mean, it was, it's, I think Bukele is an example of, you know, how quickly this can in fact be fixed, you know, and the example people, you know, this is probably a week or so ago now, so it's old news, but, you know, when Gavin Newsom just cleaned up the streets of, of yeah. San Francisco unilaterally, you know, it probably took him even less time than it took Bukele, you know, just to make the city look like it was somewhat clean. Uh, and that's because he thought an important dignitary was visiting, you know? And so it's like, it's like he, the only explanation, the only explanation that we have for the actions of our government is that we are ruled by foreigners. That is the only, what is it? That's the only explanation for what we have. We are ruled by foreigners. And those foreigners continue their rule by eliminating the concept of foreigners altogether. And reality always reasserts itself, Mr. Pete. And I really, I really am hopeful, at least for the for the future of my people. Maybe not economically necessarily, but in the sense of what they can do, I am I am hopeful. Yeah, we have to be. If we give up, I mean, you know, there's a lot. Yeah, you know, it's like Evelyn said. There's a lot we can do. There, there, there's there's a lot we can do, but it may just be that the system is too far gone at this point. And he also that. No, I was just going to say uh, about Yaki writing it, writing that Yaki was writing in 1948. You know, that was probably the darkest time in the history of Western culture in this for, for, for people like Yaki, you know? So I think, I don't want to psychologize, but it's understandable why he took such a pessimistic bent at that time. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's it when we look at, just recent history of our country what ha what's happened in the last 20 years 30 years go back 40 years go back 50 years and you see the decline how fast it can just go right downhill um you know it's it, it's not unsurprising that people would get black pilled but i think those are people who are black pilled on national politics and who are black pilled because they haven't decided to live they've decided that whatever the politics is of the time is for i don't for i don't know for what reason they don't have faith they don't have you know they aren't living historically which you know most <laughs> most people aren't um they just have nothing and they've decided that they're they've given up on anything on everything but you know one thing that i can say from you know living living where i do and being around people that i'm i'm around now you know people who've lived in this area for whose families have been here for 200 years 250 years settled this area i it's hard to be blackpilled around here it's hard to be black pilled when you're around people who actually know what living historically is they can't they can't articulate it to you they're just doing it it's you can't be black pilled if you're in culture you know that's yeah. the that's the key thing missing is that you know almost none of the younger generation have culture you know and but culture culture is something that you achieve it's not something you're born with it's something you gain by understanding and you steward you know it's 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 something and, and my ho and mass media and other stuff like that is actually a means of of totally in a about as fast of a period as possible imagine if it were turned the other way imagine if people were blasted with by state edict nothing but um you know culture on a regular basis you know yeah it wouldn't make it wouldn't make the stupid smart 
but it would completely change the tenor of how things are going here, you know? And, and, and this is, this is the thing I always want to try to emphasize to people. It's absolutely ludicrous how fast almost all of this can be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the, just the two example, the one example I gave the one, the one example you gave can, yeah. can be turned, can be turned around immediately. You turn around and meet. I mean, not, not immediately. They'll take some time. There'll be pain. Line. The line is going to go. The line may go down for a while. You know, it's not. You know, the the libertarians and the classical liberals, where if the line goes down, that means that everything's going to hell, and we got to do everything to make sure get back to where the line goes up. Well, if you improve the culture, the line will go back up. They're relics of a previous age. Yeah. I mean, liberalism and libertarianism is, I mean, it, it is basically, it's gone. It's done. That, that's, we're, we're not entering, that's not the age we're entering in. And I hate when libertarians argue that, well, libertarianism hasn't been tried. And then you have somebody like Mille in, um, in Argentina, who's you know, talking about using libertarian, no, he's, he's not talking about using explicitly libertarian means he's talking about like i mean becoming an autark is that what libertarianism is libertarianism is is all of a sudden about monarchs oh the he's talking irony. about doing doing things by fiat oh well, the irony it's i mean you know and you know what i want him to succeed I want him to do right for his people. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be extremely difficult considering the guys that we live in, but I want it. I want it for them. And I understand why so many people in the United States look over, look at Argentina and they're like, I wish we could be like, I wish we had someone like that. In our, I understand why so many Americans, especially in the MAGA and the conservative movement, worship Israel because they see a, a a society with closed borders they seemingly like their own people they have a national identity and everything and they wish they could have that here I get it I wish I wish we had a president like Bukele here I get it all we have one waiting well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he's, you know? he's 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 coming back. It's he's coming back. His his story is not over yet, guys. I mean, look, and here, here's the thing, like he's the best we got. He's he is literally the best we've got, you know. And you know, Mr. Mr. Pete, we've talked about this, I think, on the old Glory Club streams too, but like his it really does see, if I asked you right now, do you think Trump's story is over? Oh no. No. I want to see him. I want to see him win the election. I don't want to see him in jail because I don't want to see that for anybody who hasn't committed a crime. But imagine him winning the presidency from jail. <laughs> imagine I'm at, it's like that scene in the man of in, in the man. Of, was it? Uh, it's a stupid show, but I'm just reminded when um uh, when when the character in prisons Reinhard Heydrich in jail and he lets him out and he's super apologetic. Um, but um um. Anyway, it was a trick, but yeah, I mean, imagine that. Uh, I mean, what if, what if, what if Trump needs to be jailed after, let's just say, a pooch that was failed, and then he writes a um, um was it, and he writes a uh, a award winning political pamphlet called "The Art of the Struggle," and uh... <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, and he. And he's appointed yeah. speaker of the house after an unfortunate, after the president and vice president, unfortunately die. Uh, well, I don't know. You know, you, you hope to see a change in the culture of the people first. Yeah. So I think that's what elites, elites look for. That's why I think that, you know, what we're seeing now with this, the rise of the noticing and things like that. I mean, it's been a year since it's basically been a year since Kanye went off the reservation. Yeah. And crazy to think that that happened. And that's already yeah. a year ago. 
It's a year ago. Yeah, I it think was, it was December 1st. But at the same time, it was only a year ago? Yeah. And look at what's happened. You know, what, what did Stalin, was it Stalin who said um, so, sometimes, sometimes dec- nothing one. happens decades and decades and weeks and things like that? It yeah. was Lenin, yeah. Yeah, Lenin, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, Lenin was much smarter than Stalin. But um, the if if you would have told me a year ago that Twitter would be like it is right now, I thought you were insane. If you'd have told me if you'd have told me a year ago that people who were saying a year ago Twitter isn't real life are like Twitter is the public square. It is the political. It's the the political realm. I mean, I, I who could have foreseen it? I know it's, I didn't. It's crazy how things can change, and it's and it's 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 yeah, it's just it's just crazy how 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 fast things can change. You know, people, and this is this is the great lesson that you know the the greatest quote of all of Spengler. Not optimism is cowardice. That's that's I think that's you know that that kind of plays into the Stockdale paradox a little bit. I don't know if you're familiar with with that um, that whole sort of optimism is cowardice kind of thing. Um, to me, optimism is acknowledging the grim reality of your situation and having faith you'll succeed regardless. That's what optimism is to me. Um, it's not deluding yourself into thinking that things are all just going to be a okay. It's um things can be okay if I can make it through this, you know. That's that's what and and that's faith. That's faith. But um, one of the other great Spangler quotes is this. You know, history is not this, uh, and I'm I'm paraphrasing here. I'm not actually directly quoting him, but history is not a slow and gradual change. It is constantly oscillating from catastrophe to catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah, it's it really it seems like you're only going to get real change when there's a state of exception. Yeah. And that's when a disaster is happening. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, let's leave it there. <laughs> we yes, we sir. Could keep, we could keep going. We um, probably could. <laughs> but um remind everybody uh plug anything and uh we'll get out of here old glory club if you're not subscribed already i don't know what to tell you i mean just 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 do it um and join the restoring of american culture and the west's cultural mission with the old glory club um my stuff i mean i mean i've been off twitter and telegram past couple of days if you want to follow me at calf king paul go ahead um if you want to buy my collection of short stories, a country squire's notebook on my gum road. Um, that's, I mean, like all of Pete's stuff, listen to all of Pete's shows, read all of a Pete's link. Substack. Yeah. Give, I'll have a give, link to all this stuff. Give, give, give Pete all of your money. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're listening on Spotify, if you've all, you probably already heard the, the, the stop halfway in the episode where he's like, this is the part where I tell you how you can support the show. You're going to get two of those. You're going to get two of those today, except it's coming from my map, my you mouth. Listen. All right. Give, give, Paul give Pete your money. to the show. <laughs> I love, I love Pete's show guys. Like, you know, I don't just come on here, you know, cause you know, Pete's my friend and I like him and I like talking about Yaki. Yeah, that's all true. But I, I, I like Pete's show. I listen to his stuff. So, you know, you know, I mean, give him your money so he can keep doing this. Well, I appreciate that, Paul. And um, I will link to everything so people can uh, check out the Old Glory Club and possibly uh, go buy Paul's book and support him. If we're not supporting each other in this uh, in this area, in this group, in this uh, little world that we've created, um, no one else is going to do it. So um, let's support each other. I appreciate it, Paul. I appreciate all the kind words. Thank you. Of course, man. Thanks for having me on.